Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, all right, so yesterday I introduced the N-equals to supersymmetric algebra, uh, super multiplets, and we uh, wrote down the Lagrangians for uh, vector multiplets and hyper multiplets for N-equals to supersymmetry. Uh, so now let's continue by looking at the moduli space of supersymmetric black one. And uh, we'll start by looking at the classical modular space of black one. And for simplicity, uh, we will set the masses uh, of hypermodulus that's to zero. Okay. So uh, the classical modular space of supersymmetric black one is the space of minima of the scalar potential. And in particular, uh, since the scalar potential is a uh, sum of squares of d terms and f terms, so we'll have to set to zero the d terms uh, for uh, associated to each uh, vector multiple, uh, n equal one the vector multiple. So now I'm using n equal one as per symmetry notation, and, and the f term for the general uh, phi in the n equal two vector multiple, the f term. Uh, Say for the chiral Q tilde in an n equal to hyper multiplets and the F term of the chiral Q in an n equal to hyper multiplets. So this is in the vector multiplets and this is in the hyper multiplets. Okay? So if you set to zero the D term, so the equation that you get is as follows so 1 over G squared commutator of 5 by dagger plus. Um, Q to the dagger minus Q to the dagger to tilde equals zero. So here, just think of a Q and Q tilde as matrices. So I'm a bit schematic. Indices are constructed in the obvious and unique way. So the F term uh, of phi coming from the uh, n equal one potential looks uh, like Q to tilde equals zero because we call the super potential was Q tilde by Q. And uh, the f terms of q tilde and q are phi q equals zero, and let's say q tilde phi equals zero. Okay. So the classical modular space of Bakwa, of supersymmetric Bakwa, is given by say the solutions uh, of the f terms and d term equations, and then uh, uh, modeled out by the gauge group. Because we only look at the agent by so let me reduce notation and, and call MFD the space of solution of the F term and D term equations divided by the gauge group. So uh, the, even this class the modular space uh, of Paco can be quite complicated, in particular, it can uh, uh, contain uh, different branches. So let's first look at uh, the Coulomb branch, which will be our main interest uh, in the rest of the course. So the Coulomb branch of the uh, modular space of Lacqua, and again, now I'm just uh, doing the classical analysis. So this is uh, obtained by setting uh, the scalars in the hypermultiplets to zero. So these three equations are trivially satisfied. And then uh, uh, the d term equation tells us that uh, the scalar phi in a vector multiple can uh, acquire a vector, but it has to commute with its uh, Hermitian conjugate. Okay. Note that yesterday we saw that uh, when I introduced the Lagrangian uh, uh, for hyper multiple uh, charge uh, under the gauge group, we also had the uh, mass terms, and I told you that the uh, uh, superpotential masses uh, appear in the Lagrangian on the same footing as uh, phi. And we had a condition uh, that n equal to square symmetry requires uh, the anti commutator of the, sorry, the commutator of uh, the mass matrix and the complex computer uh, have to vanish. So this is essentially the same condition. Okay. So in particular, since uh, the scalar phi and this complex, uh, in its Hermitian conjugate, uh, uh, sorry, this should be zero, uh, have to commute, uh, we can diagonalize them, uh, okay, by using a gauge transformation. So if we diagonalize, uh, 
you can write uh, the complex scalar phi in the vector multiplet uh, as some in a combination uh, with the coefficients Hi of, uh, say, Hi, where Hi are generators uh, of the Cartan subalgebra. <laughs> Of the, the algebra of the H group. Okay. So this branch is called the Coulomb branch. Because uh, for uh, generic values of phi, so generic values of this uh, uh, coefficients AI, say you can think of AI as the eigenvalues of uh, phi in some appropriate places, the H group uh, is broken to. Uh, it's a billion uh, subgroup, uh, uh, the maximum is the group with the generators, whose Lie algebra is the Cartan subalgebra. Okay, and uh, so you have a bunch of uh, uh, abelian massless vector multiples, and the rest of the vector multiples are massive. So at low energies, this, uh, you want this abelian uh, vector multiples to carry uh, Coulomb force. Okay. And okay, to be precise, uh, there is also uh, some residual uh, gauge symmetry, which is the bi group. Uh, okay, which acts on uh, these scalars AI and on the UI. So, this symbol, if you don't know what it means, it just means that this is not the product, it's the bi group, uh, uh, which uh, essentially acts on the scalars AI. Uh, does not commit with this U1. I'll give you an example in a second. So the Coulomb branch, uh, classically at least, uh, takes this form. So it looks like, uh, so it's parameterized by this complex scalar AI, and there are as many of them as the rank of the gauge group. So it looks like C to the rank of G. But as I told you, there is an extra. Uh, so this discrete part of the gauge group which survives, which is the Y group, and so we have to divide uh, by the Y group and find the uh, uh, gauge invariant. So we'll, the gauge invariants are built up, so if you wish, are uh, polynomials in the AI which are invariant under the Y group. Huh? Okay, and then it's a classical result that this is also isomorphic to C to the rank of G. So, uh, okay, so let me say, yeah. so the Y group is uh, essentially some residual uh, gauge transformations that you have to divide by. So let me give you an example then, in case you're not too much familiar with uh, group theory. So say that uh, the gauge group is uh, SUN. So then we can diagonalize uh, by Eigenvalue of a1, an. So now I'm using a. Okay, let me use this presentation. Lambda 1, lambda n. So now I'm over parameterizing phi, we call phi is traceless, so some high lambda i is 0 here. So then the value group of sun is just a symmetric group of n elements, this permutes and uh, acts by permuting uh, the lambda the eigenvalues themselves. Okay, so this is part of the gauge symmetry. And so, okay, so the Coulomb branch is, uh, is, uh, is parameterized by these uh, eigenvalues lambda i, so the complex scalar phi, uh, modulo the bi group. Uh, and so in particular, we can parameterize it by um, uh, invariants of the Y group, which are the Casimir invariants, for instance. So let's define the Casimir invariant CK to be 1 over K trace um, pi to the K, where K that runs from 2 to N. So when K equal 1, uh, so this is obviously gauge invariant, uh, but it's invariant under it. This discrete subgroup, which is the y group, this is uh, 1 over k some i lambda i. 
in the case. So you see explicitly that it's invariant on the permutations along the i. And so if k equal 1, this is trace pi, which is 0, because we're working with s u n. And then all these other Casimir invariants, when k runs from 2 to n, are non trivial and independent. So if you consider k larger than n, then because of the k Hamilton theorem, you can express them in terms of these objects. Okay. So these Casimir invariants give a parameterization of uh, the Coulomb branch in the uh, rank G of them, in this case, n minus 1 of them. OK, so next, uh, uh, let's look at the Higgs branch. So if you're not too comfortable uh, with group theory, let me stress that for the rest of the course, at least that we only use SU2. So we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, OK, so the Higgs branch uh, of and x corresponds to the situation where now the scalar in the vector multiplex is zero, and the scalars q and q tilde in the hypermultiplex can acquire uh, expectation value. So, in particular, in these two last two f term equations are trivially satisfied, but we have to satisfy this equation and that equation. So, what we find is that. Uh, so we have to satisfy the f term equation for phi. Let me do some notation. So here again we call so h is a um, means q is a value. So this is some notation. So we want to set the q q tilde to zero, and then there is also a real condition coming from here from the. Um, Time. So this is QQ dagger minus QQ dagger equal to zero. Okay, so I wrote this as a, a complex equation which comes uh, from the F term and the real equation which comes from the D term. Uh, in fact, you can think of, of uh, mu C and mu R. Uh, as a triplet uh, of the SC2 R symmetry. And uh, okay, you might call it, sometimes people call this a triplet of D term questions uh, if you use uh, any of this question. Um, okay, and so the Higgs branch of the modular space. It's, it's parameterized by hypermultiplets to feel a uh, such that uh, this triplet uh, of uh, SC2, this SC2R triplet of a uh, uh, condition, and we call it mu factor of H, H diagram, is set to zero. And finally, we divide by the gauge rule. Okay, so this construction is called uh, hyperkeller quotient. Where, okay, so you start from uh, some flat space which is parameterized by the hypermultiplex q, q to the dagger, and then you pose a, say, a triplet uh, of equation for each generator. Uh, in the gauge group, and finally model out by the gauge symmetry. Okay, there is uh, quite a bit of interesting uh, geometry behind this hyperkeller quotient, but uh, this will not play an important role in the following, so I will not go into that. So finally, you might also have, uh, okay. yeah. you might also have uh, mint branches, Oh, maybe I, I did not say why this is called a Higgs branch. The reason is that for a, 
uh, generic choice of uh, Q and Q tilde, which satisfy the F and D term equations, so this triplet of equation, the gauge group G is completely Higgs. Uh, so there is no residual gauge group. And this is the reason for the name of Higgs branch. So as I said, in addition, there might also be uh, mixed branches. Uh, if, uh, say, both, both by a non trivial expectation value and Q or Q uh, tilde, a non trivial expectation value. So you might have solutions of uh, F and D term equations where both by and Q are not zero. Okay. So uh, the picture of the classical uh, moduli space. Uh, uh, to keep in mind, uh, so this uh, again is just a, a tutorial, it's as follows, so say, so you have a Coulomb branch, where uh, uh, the scalar find the vector multiple requires the expectation value, then you have a Higgs branch uh, for the vector multiple uh, um, the scalars and the hypermultiples acquire expectation value, and this, uh, the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch meet when uh, phi is zero, Q is zero, and Q is zero. Okay, so let's say this is the origin of the Coulomb branch, so this is phi equal to equal to the equal zero. Okay, let me draw this slightly different, different things. So here you have some. Uh, X branch which emanates uh, out of the Coulomb branch and intersects with it at point. And in the absence of uh, masses, uh, the equations for the X branch are invariant on the rescale. You can rescale Q and Q tilde and get another solution. So it looks like gone. This is uh, why to look like that. Uh, so finally, in addition, you might have uh, Mixed branches where uh, both uh, the scalars in the vector multiples and the scalars in the hyper multiples acquire expectation value. And uh, so the picture is going to look like this. Uh, <coughs> let me see if I can draw it on the board. So this will be uh, the mixed branch. And you see it, it's, it's a mixed branch it's a, both the scalar. So the scalars in the vector multiplets, so the directions here look as follows. So here in the horizontal direction phi requires expectation value in the uh, vertical direction q and p tilde require expectation value. And so say if you're uh, at the point here in, in a mixed branch, uh, this will uh, We'll have a non trivial expectation value for phi. So, okay, like this value of phi, and also some non trivial uh, expectation value for q and tilde. Okay? So, in particular, from this uh, uh, picture, we see that. Uh, Locally, around uh, any point of this modular space of aqua, <coughs> the classical uh, modular space of aqua looks like uh, a component MV where the scalars in the vector multiplets acquire uh, expectation value and vary, whereas the ones in the hyper multiplets uh, uh, are frozen, times the component MH where the scalars in the hyper multiplet vary, acquire expectation value, whereas the other. Uh, the scalars in the vector multiplets uh, are frozen. Okay, so say if you're at the point here, then uh, uh, this M B is just a uh, Coulomb branch, and M H is trivial. If you're at the point uh, up here, then M H is the Higgs branch uh, locally, and M B is trivial. But you might be say at the point uh, like this, uh, where you you can either move uh, along. Uh, 
direction MD, giving back to the scalar spin vector multiplexer. So, so this is uh, non trivial, but you can also move uh, in the other direction and give a back to expression about the scalar spin vector multiplexer. So, this is just a uh, Roughly the structure of the classical moduli space of that one. So now let me move on to the quantum moduli space. So let me give you first uh, the bottom line so what happens to this picture over there. So qualitatively what happens is the same, it's the following. Okay, let me first draw because it's hard to reproduce it on the board and then it's fine. Uh, So what do I mean by this? So this is uh, all the uh, quantum multi space of that one. Uh, so this is uh, the original Higgs branch, the con that we had here. Then we had the, the mixed branch, and it ended up uh, here. In, in principle, it can be separated from the Higgs branch, uh, and the separation is due to quantum effects, so the the scale of this operation is of order lambda, the strong coupling of the dynamically generated scale of the theory. And this is uh, what was the original Coulomb branch. Okay, so first of all, because of n equal to supersymmetry, you cannot generate a superpotential. And so uh, none, of the, none of these branches uh, of the moduli space can be lifted. But in principle, they can be deformed by quantum corrections. So in particular, this. Uh, the fact that I've drawn these uh, lines uh, you know, as weakly means that there are quantum corrections on so the scale of the wiggles is again order lambda. And, uh, okay, but let me mention uh, two results and then I'll briefly try to motivate. So, the metric on, uh, well, okay, so still you see that log cabin. The quantum uh, modular space of Bakwa looks like a uh, uh, product of uh, components where the uh, expectation values of scalars in vector multiples vary and the component where the scalars in hypermultiples vary. Okay? But then, uh, so one can conclude that the metric on uh, MV, so the components where the scalars in the vector multiples vary, receives uh, quantum corrections. And as you see, these are one loop corrections uh, plus uh, instanton corrections. <coughs> and uh, well, essentially, most of the rest of the course will be devoted to determining these quantum corrections. So, on the other hand, uh, note that here, let's say on the Higgs branch, uh, I didn't draw any wiggles. And the reason is that the metric. Uh, on the Higgs branch and generically on any components where the hypermultiplex uh, uh, scalar vary uh, does not receive quantum correction. So this is uh, classically exact. Okay, so I'm going to motivate uh, two statements in a, a second. And so in particular here, let's say, let's look at this uh, mixed branch. So this mixed branch has a, had a component uh, in, along the hypermultiplet direction and a component along the vector multiplet direction. So the component along the vector multiplet direction is uh, affected by quantum correction. So here you get uh, 
some uh, you know weekly structure um, where the quantum corrections are, are order lambda, but uh, so the, the metric along the direction where the hypermultiplets acquire expectation value does not receive quantum corrections. So if the lines the lines remain straight. Okay. So let's try to motivate uh, these two statements. Uh, okay, so in particular, say for this, this reason, since the metrics, metric on the exponential and say, on the, the components of the modular space with hypermultiple square expectation value is classically exact, uh, the dynamics on the X branch is not very interesting. So this is just fixed by classical considerations. Okay, so why is uh, uh, the metric on the uh, Coulomb branch uh, corrected in quantum mechanical whereas the one on the Higgs branch is not them. So the component uh, MV where the vector multiplet uh, scalars acquire expectation values is parameterized uh, by scalars in vector multiplet. And uh, as you know, it's at the generic point uh, in uh, the Coulomb branch, uh, um, H group G is broken to the ability, it's a billion subgroup, you uh, want to the rank of G. So this is parameterized by scalars, uh, <coughs> uh, we call them AI, in uh, a billion vector multiplets. Okay. Whereas uh, and H, the component where the scalars in the hypermultiplets acquired expectation value, is parameterized again by some complex scalars, but now in uh, uh, hypermultiplets. And let me call these scalars uh, X uh, capital I, X in the capital I. <coughs> and this scalar has to live in a neutral uh, hypermultiplets. Well, essentially, the reason is that if the hypermultiplets were charged, they would fix the gauge group and they would be eaten uh, uh, by the, say, W boson in the Higgs mechanism, so they will uh, disappear. And in particular, this uh, neutral hypermultiplets, these uh, scalars, uh, neutral scalars in hypermultiplets, can be thought of as the scalars in uh, some uh, gauge invariant combinations of the uh, hypers that we had um, in the UV Lagrange chart. So is this point clear why this, the scalars have to be neutral? Okay, I assume the answer is yes. So now if we use the, this information, we can write down uh, the structure of the low energy effective action for very low energies. So, this is what I would call an uh, infrared uh, effective action. So again, think of this as some Wilsonian effective actions of very low energy, so much lower than all uh, the scales in the theory. So, say if we uh, use for now just the constraints of n equal 1 supersymmetry, uh, so let's first focus on uh, the scalars in hypermultiplets. They can uh, appear in the effective action through some uh, scalar potential term. Right? So it will look like something like u for theta a of one. And say so the I use capital letters for the chiral fields uh, which contain these complex scalars. So x i x field i and their conjugate. Uh, Sephora, what do you mean? So, can you say I'm the neutral part? Yes, oh, just a second. Okay, so in the original theory we had both, uh, we had charged hypermultiplets in general, but if you give a vacuum expectation value to a scalar in a charged hypermultiplet, then, uh, so this will uh, break the gauge loop by the Higgs mechanism, and uh, the scalars which are charged will be eaten by, say, the W bosons in the Higgs mechanism, so they will not remain as low energy, as massless degrees of freedom. They're 
they become the longitudinal components of the massive vectors. Okay. So in particular, you uh, well, you know that uh, uh, to parameterize the modular space of Lockwood. Just a second, the char charge under what? Under the gauge. Under gauge. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. okay, since they are charged, they okay. participate to the Higgs mechanism and are eaten by the uh, <coughs> uh, vector multiples, which become massive. And in particular, well, you know that to parameterize the uh, uh, modular space of buckle, you should only use gauge invariant objects, a neutral object. The reason is that uh, those which, the components which are charged are eaten by the massive model. Okay, so now I was trying to write down uh, uh, some uh, effective uh, action, well, here, effective Lagrangian. For these uh, massless degrees of freedom at uh, some generic points in the modular space. Okay. And uh, so if this uh, hypermultiples uh, here were charged, uh, you, you could have in their kinetic term uh, uh, the uh, vector multiples opinion. So you know that typically you have I don't know, x, uh, x dagger uh, e to the v, right? Did you see this in the course? But now, so these objects xi are uh, are neutral, and so here the vector multiplex on okay, gi uh, cannot appear just because this uh, scalar is neutral. Well, and here I was talking about n equal one vector multiplex. Cannot appear, but then if we use n equal to supersymmetry, uh, that relates uh, the n equal one vector multiplex d i to some uh, chiral uh, scalar in the vector multiple in the n same n equal two vector multiple. So we, by using n equal to supersymmetry, we then we learn that the n equal one chirals. Uh, by i, which are super partners of this vector map, but also cannot appear here. Okay. So this tells us that uh, the low energy effective action for the scalars uh, in the neutral hypermultiples, which parameterizes the uh, uh, infrared uh, dynamics uh, on the Higgs branch or along NH to, uh, to be more general, uh, is not affected by the vector mass. Okay. So, well, let me write a metric on NH. So in particular, the scalars, uh, a, the expectation value of the scalars AI, since they belong to vector multiplets, cannot uh, affect the metric on the Higgs branch. So okay. this was one point. The second point is that, uh, as I stressed yesterday, you can view uh, the masses uh, as also living in some vector multiplets, uh, say for uh, back, some background non-dynamical vector multiplets for the global symmetry. So masses uh, also cannot affect the metric on the Higgs branch by the same amount of reason. And uh, we're going to see in a few minutes that uh, even the dynamically generated scale lambda of the theory, say, which will determine the quantum corrections to the Coulomb branch, sit, sits in a vector multiplet. So if you can view lambda again as uh, uh, being on the same footing as the scalar is AI. So even uh, so, since lambda uh, governs the quantum corrections, uh, scale of the quantum corrections in the gauge theory, that means that uh, uh, quantum corrections do not affect the metric on the Higgs branch or uh, say on some mixed branch like this along the 
direction where the hypermultiplex vary. And that the conclusion is that the, the metric on the Higgs branch is classical itself, because it cannot perceive any quantum interactions. Okay, so this is the reason why uh, the dynamics on the Higgs branch is not very interesting. So, can you see any why the vector cannot appear? Why vector? Mm -hmm. ah, because you see here, so I, I wrote down uh, uh, some uh, infrared effective Lagrangian using n equal one formalism. I you know, so it's going to be a scalar potential for the chiral uh, uh, fields which contains these scalars. So these scalars being neutral <coughs> vector multiplets. So uh, the vector, the n equal one vector multiplets uh, cannot it's appear not here because it's charged. Okay. Because it's charged. Because I mean, this this object is not charged, so the vector multiplet will not appear in the scalar potential. And it's the n equal one vector multi that cannot appear uh, in the scalar potential if you require n equal two supersymmetric, its super partner, which is the scalar pi i, can also not appear. Okay. So, all right, so, yeah, so no, essentially no parameters can, uh, no, um, no parameters like the masses or, um, Modulized in the vector multiples like the i, or similarly that a strong coupling scale can appear in this scalar uh, potential. Could the Faya Teliopoulos uh, Yeah, the Faya Teliopoulos uh, could appear, but I decided not to talk about the Faya Teliopoulos terms. Because anyway, the only the Faya Teliopoulos terms uh, only appear if say, the gauge group contains only one factor. Uh, there are other reasons not to like them, but uh, apart from that, uh, okay. So if you have a, a gauge group which contains Fayet-Leopoulos terms, uh, the Fayet-Leopoulos terms secretly big in some uh, hypermultiplets, and so they can correct the Higgs branch. Okay, so this was but for. But the interaction uh, is just at the at the origin of the modulus space, or what? The action of this would just be at the origin of the modulus space. The action on the Faye Leopoulos. Mm -hmm. Well, typically, what, what will happen is that if you turn on Faye Leopoulos terms, so, uh, they are the dimensionful objects, so they will have uh, a scale. So, one thing that they can do is to uh, smoothen yeah. out uh, its branch. Uh, in some cases, they can also leave them complete. But, uh, okay, that's. I mean, if you're interested, we can discuss later, but it's not. Uh, I mean, it's still uh, true even if you have a uh, Fayet-Leopoulos terms, they, they will affect the metric on the on the Higgs branch or on the on this component MH of the modulized space, but still there will be no quantum corrections. Okay, so I think this is uh, almost the last mention of the Higgs branch in this course. Uh, but now let's look at uh, the part of the infrared effective action which. Uh, uh, deals with the scalars uh, AI in the medium vector multiplex. So the dots here. So yesterday I told you that the most general uh, n equal to supersymmetric action for vector multiplex is governed by a single uh, holomorphic function which is called the free potential. And so now here we're going to write a, a theory for the massless vector multiplets, which are these uh, abelian vector multiplets here containing AI. And so we get uh, some terms in the action which take the standard form, uh, which can be derived from our free potentials. So we have uh, some uh, gauge kinetic term. Okay, so now I'm using, so A is. Uh, a i is uh, the n equal one chiral which contains a i, and then I will use uh, w i alpha for start with the gauge minus lambda i alpha plus, etc. So we'll have a gauge kinetic term uh, for the gauge genus, uh, which is covered by the second derivative of the prepotential. And then there is a uh, 
some Taylor potential for uh, these scalars, uh, some Taylor potential term, which is again uh, governed by the free potential. For now, Fi is uh, the first derivative of the free potential with respect to the Ai, and Fij is the second derivative. This will be in terms uh, of uh, an infrared uh, effective prepotential f of the uh, a, which is a function only of the massless uh, abelian vector multiplets. So the okay. So in particular, this effective potential will be um, affected by quantum corrections, uh, and we will see there one loop and uh, uh, one loop perturbative corrections, and also non perturbative correction due to incentives. Uh, and so this uh, it would be uh, non-trivial to derive uh, the form of this potential. But if you want to determine the uh, complete form of the low energy effective action on the modular space of aqua, so the part which deals with the hypermultiplets, it's easy, it's just a classical, uh, uh, just uh, determined by classical analysis, so we we'll no longer worry about it in the following. Whereas the part which has to go with the vector multiplet uh, uh, receives quantum correction, and so. Uh, it will be a non trivial task to determine uh, this low energy effective potential. So, what uh, Cyber and uh, Cyber and Witten did uh, in the famous paper in 94 uh, uh, was to find uh, a way to determine uh, this uh, low energy infrared effective free potential exactly. Okay, we'll get to the, uh, there after the. Break. But, so let me first uh, make uh, two more points. So in the following, we'll also need uh, some information about uh, perturbative uh, quantum corrections, in particular <coughs> the anomaly of the U1R symmetry and uh, the perturbative renormalization group of the gauge coupling. So I know that you've uh, already seen this in the context of n equal one supersymmetry. So let me uh, just be quick to state uh, the results. So in the n equal two supersymmetry algebra, we had uh, u1 times uh, sc2 r symmetry, and particularly the u1 r symmetry is a uh, chiral symmetry and can uh, uh, can and generally does acquire an anomaly. Okay, so as usually, the anomaly can be uh, seen either by looking at one loop diagrams or uh, by looking at instanton effects. So let me just uh, remind you of the one loop uh, construction. So suppose that you consider a triangle diagram where here you have some uh, U1 uh, R symmetry current, or say a vector which couples to the U1 R symmetry current. Here you have a some gauge uh, current or gauge bosons, and here another gauge current. And uh, flowing in the, in the loop, you have a uh, chiral fermions. Okay. So then, because of these triangle diagrams, which are non trivial, uh, you can find, uh, you can deduce that uh, the currents. Uh, the current for the U1R symmetry is no longer conserved, but uh, it will have a right hand side, which is called uh, the anomaly, uh, which looks as follows. So it receives contribution from uh, by fermions, uh, psi i. So the contribution will be proportional to the R charges of the by fermion, because that determines the coupling here at this vertex. And this will multiply the following uh, 
discussion. <coughs> so the second term uh, is view. So Ri is the representation on the gauge group uh, uh, um, that the fermions transform in. So this term here, you have a quadratic term uh, trace over the gauge group, which comes from these two indices, and uh, that we knew when star we knew come from these gauge bosons. And so we, one can uh, re-express this uh, as an anomaly coefficient, uh, which is given by the sum of Vulcan. So here the trace uh, is over the representation Ri uh, of the bifermion, so let's express all of this in terms of the representation, uh, say the fundamental representation. And so we want to write the formula like this, so you have the trace of the fundamental uh, at the new star at the new. So that here, uh, what we have here, here is uh, the instant number density. So here in the, the coefficient in front, we will still have the R charge of uh, the um, fermions, the bulk fermion psi i, and then we'll have a conversion factor when we uh, you know, change normalization from uh, the trace in the representation R i to the trace in the fundamental representation. So this is um, the so-called thinking index of T R i of the representation. So let me remind you that uh, so if you are, have a representation Ri and you want to compute the trace of two generators of the gauge group, uh, this will be some uh, quadratic Casimir efficiency of Ri and theta AB. Okay? So you do the same uh, uh, for the fundamental representation, and so you see that T of Ri is nothing but. This Casimir uh, for the representation Ri is normalized by the Casimir and the fundamental representation. So, this in particular, this linking index is in particular is independent of the normalization. And since the anomaly here is physical, that means the coefficient is better than not dependent on normalization. So, I would call this. Uh, Object will find the anomaly coefficient a. So, for instance, uh, so now if we apply the formula to uh, n equals to gauge theory. So the anomaly coefficient uh, is some. Uh, over five fermions, uh, R charges of the five fermions, and the thinking index of their representation will look uh, as follows. So, first, let's look at the vector multiple. So, the vector multiple contains two five fermions, uh, the KG of the charge R charge one, so we get two times one times the thinking index of their joint representation. And then we have the hypermultiplex. They also contain two bite fermions. But so the scalars uh, in the vector multiplex, I told you yesterday, they carry uh, zero R charge. So the fermions will carry minus one R charge. And then we have the sum uh, over hyper. Okay. So this is two times Casimir. Uh, by the thinking index of the adjoint minus uh, the sum of the linking index uh, indices for the hyper. Okay. So, whatever is uh, the gauge group and the matter content uh, uh, of your theory, that will determine these two linking indices coefficients. And so, what you can use this formula to do this anomaly. So, in particular, for say SUNC uh, 
sketch with the, and I have a, a high person in the fundamental representation, then uh, the anomaly A will be two times uh, so two and C <coughs> minus uh, and F. So two and C is uh, the linking index of the adjoint. One uh, is the linking index. So next is the relation to uh, the instant and density and, uh, and the fifth angle. So here the violation of uh, um, conservation of the uh, U1 R current is proportional to uh, an anomaly coefficient times the instant on uh, uh, number density. And so since, uh, say, if we perform a U1 R uh, uh, transformation with parameter alpha, then uh, the effective action uh, will not be invariant uh, due to the anomaly, but we will transform uh, additively by a term which is uh, equal to alpha, the uh, one as uh, a symmetry parameter, times A, the anomaly coefficient, times uh, the integral of this uh, instant on uh, charge density. Okay. Integral before x. Uh, And this term here uh, is nothing but the instant on number k. Okay. So, uh, but recall that in the action you can have a theta angle which also uh, multiplies the instant on charge density. So we have a term which looks like this. So you can uh, restore. Uh, uh, in uh, U1 R symmetry by declaring that uh, under this U1 uh, transformation, um, that not only the bifermions will transform into uh, themselves up to the phase, but also the theta angle will shift. So if you assign this shift to the theta angle, you can cancel the extra term. But now, I mean, uh, <coughs> so psi is a field, whereas theta is a, is a coefficient. Okay? So if you shift the theta, you change uh, the coupling, uh, the couplings in the action. That's it's not uh, uh, going to be really a symmetry because it changes uh, the coupling. On the other hand, we know that the theta angle is an angle, so physics is uh, in it's, uh, really invariant when uh, you shift theta by 2 pi. And so if this coefficient alpha times a is a multiple of 2 pi, you actually do get the symmetry. Okay? So if alpha is uh, 2 pi times an integer divided by a, where so this integer check n run from 0 to minus one, uh, you really have a symmetry. <coughs> okay. So classically, this uh, uh, U1R symmetry is U1. You can choose any uh, parameter <coughs> alpha, uh, which is an angle. But quantum mechanically, uh, because of the anomaly, you only have a symmetry if uh, the parameter takes these values. And so the U1 R symmetry in the classical action is broken by an anomaly to some discrete subgroup, <coughs> which is ZA, uh, which consists of U1 R symmetry rotations with these discrete uh, parameters. This reminds me of 
from Beijing or from Beijing. Uh, yes, it is related to uh, in fact, uh, initially I was planning to discuss uh, in more detail the relation to in symptoms, but in the interest of time, we will not do it, but I can discuss this further. Okay. So let's just uh, uh, remember that uh, due to this uh, chiral anomaly, the U1 uh, R symmetry in the action is actually broken to this three subgroup. Okay. But uh, as usual, with broken symmetry, you can still uh, uh, use. Uh, uh, the constraints in the action, say, if you assign a transformation bar, a transformation law to some of the parameters. So next, let me just briefly remind you about uh, um, uh, running uh, gauge coupling, and then we'll take a break. Out that this uh, perturbative renormalization of the gauge coupling is uh, related to the Q1 R anomaly. So, so recall you saw in uh, Domenico's last lecture that uh, so at one loop uh, you have the standard formula for the uh, renormalization group running of the gauge coupling as a function of mu, the energy scale, which is some. Um, uh, uh, beta function coefficient b divided by 16 pi squared okay. and then Domenico explained that if you uh, well and then let me also introduce again the complex five gauge coupling tau again as a function of mu this is going to be theta theta angle function of mu divided by Pi plus pi plus pi over g squared as a function of mu. And if you use any for one super symmetry, you can think of mu, the energy scale, as some complex variable, <coughs> just the real variable. And then the one loop running is uh, essentially governed by this formula. So lambda is some uh, dynamically generated scale, b is this uh, one loop. Uh, running coefficient, and this is equal to the one in some action. So it's equal to the e to by i tau of mu. So if you take the log of this, uh, of this expression, you'll see that the complex by coupling runs log everything to Again, this is nothing but the one in some action for BTS. So now for uh, Domenico gave you the, the formula that determines the beta the one beta function coefficient in terms uh, of the matter content, and if you specify Specialize uh, to uh, n equal to gauge theory again, say with some uh, gauge group and method content, uh, then you can find uh, so you plug it into the formula that the many gave you. Uh, you count the number of uh, complex scalars, vectors, and uh, uh, five fermions, and you will find that this uh, one loop coefficient is nothing but uh, the Dean index of the adjunct representation. This is the contribution from vector multiplets minus uh, the sum of the infinite indices of the representations of hyper multiplets. Okay. And this is nothing but uh, the anomaly coefficient uh, that uh, we have here divided by two. Okay. 
And then because of uh, uh, holomorphic argument, uh, this one loop formula is uh, exact for all the perturbation theory. And uh, but we will see that uh, it can uh, receive in some directions. So, in particular, so let's compute the R chart of uh, lambda to the B, which is uh, the R chart of, of this one in sub action. So, lambda to the B is proportional to the uh, to E to the I theta. This term here. So now the, the gauge coupling does not transform under the R simply, but the theta angle transforms because of this anomaly. And so, in particular, the R charge of E to the I theta is given uh, by the anomaly coefficient A, which is just twice uh, the one loop uh, the function coefficient. Okay? So from this we learn that our charge of lambda is two. Okay. So if, uh, if you use n equal one supersymmetry, uh, and when you apply this polymorphy argument, you say, uh, okay, <coughs> since you can think of mu the energy scale as sitting in uh, some n equal one uh, chiral multiplet. Lambda appears on the same footing, so lambda is really living in some n equal one uh, uh, background chiral multiplet. So now, uh, so we've learned that uh, lambda is viewed uh, as a background scalar in that n equal one vector multiplet, and it also has a uh, one R charge too. And in addition, uh, uh, lambda is also an S R single. <coughs> The reason is uh, the reason for this is that uh, the S two are symmetry. Since S two does not have an anomaly, so theta does not transform. So okay, so lambda sits uh, in a um, chiral multiplet. It has R charge two. It's an S two R singlet. So you might uh, uh, think that maybe lambda, in fact, uh, is just. Uh, Scalar uh, background scalar. In uh, an n equal to vector multiplet. Okay. So uh, say like um, A. Because uh, so this are you know the same properties as A, the scalar in the vector multiple, but it's an S2 R singlet. It lives in an N equal one chiral, it has a one R charge too. And indeed uh, uh, this is correct. So the answer is yes. So as I promised, uh, lambda sits in an N equal two vector multiple. And to see that uh, uh, to understand this, let's just uh, uh, consider some uh, some vacuum on the Coulomb branch where the gauge group G is broken, say, to E1 uh, to the rank of G uh, and the by group. But, uh, we will not have to worry too much about it. So the perturbative running of the gauge coupling looks as follows. So if I plot the uh, 1 over G squared, the coupling, the running gauge coupling as a function of uh, The energy scale, and since the running is logarithmic, I mean, plot the running versus the log of the energy scale. So we start in the ultraviolet with uh, gauge group G. Uh, the gauge coupling has some uh, one loop running, which is given by this formula. So it will go, uh, so if the theory is anomaly free, it will, uh, the gauge coupling will uh, go towards str uh, strong coupling. So I'll say in particular, Keeps going uh, uh, to strong coupling, it will keep the uh, infinite coupling at the scale lambda. Okay. So this is, uh, say, perturbatively okay. But now, if uh, uh, the scalar phi acquires an expectation value, 
if we break the grade school G to some uh, uh, abelian uh, subgroup U1 at some scale, which is essentially governed by phi. So at this scale, you are left with some uh, theory of abelian vector multiplets with no massless matter, so the beta function is zero, and so the gauge coupling will freeze. Okay. So you will end up with uh, some effective gauge coupling in the infrared, and so here this, this value is nothing but 1 over g squared, evaluated at the expectation value of phi. Okay. So next, uh, let me call this one over g squared in the infrared. <coughs> so if you write uh, uh, the answer for a complexified coupling, so we introduce uh, the theta angle, which does not play any other role. So this will be set by the value of the complexified gauge coupling at the uh, scale of the field where the uh, gauge coupling is frozen. And so this is given by 1 over 2 pi i d log of lambda over expectation value of pi. But here, being a bit schematic, I will be more precise in the next lecture. So now, if you look at the right hand side, you have a, a logarithmic. Can you say these things again, please? It was very fast. Uh, what? Of the, of the freezing on the gauge coupling. Yeah. So in the in the UV, you have some gauge uh, uh, with gauge group G. Uh, the gauge coupling runs logarithmically according to the one loop uh, formula it's running. I plotted here the uh, coupling at the energy scale mu versus the logarithm of the energy scale, so it will be linear. So in particular, if uh, if there was no that for phi, and uh, so you keep going with the uh, one loop uh, running, you will hit the uh, infinite coupling uh, at the dynamical generated scale lambda. But uh, what if instead uh, phi applies an expectation value? So then at the, at the scale of this uh, vacuum expectation value of phi, the gauge root is broken to a bunch of new ones, okay? And then, it, so everything is massive, you only get a massless U1 uh, field and the beta function is uh, zero. Okay, so the beta function is zero, so now the, the gauge coupling is frozen, it remains constant, constant in the new data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the uh, value of the gauge coupling in the infrared is uh, controlled by the beta. I'll just uh, find this way. Okay, so now if you look at the right hand side of this expression, we have phi, which is a scalar in uh, n equal 2 vector multiplet, and it appears uh, on the same footing uh, as lambda. So from this, we see that lambda also has to sit in n equal 2 vector multiplet. Okay. And now if you use uh, and if you use this information, then you can conclude, say, that the metric on the on the Higgs branch does not receive corrections uh, into lambda. And, uh, okay, similarly, by using the homomorphy, one can deduce that uh, there are no extra uh, perturbative corrections beyond one loop, essentially because they will violate homomorphy. So higher order corrections, uh, perturbative corrections will look like this. G squared uh, is proportional to log uh, lambda up to coefficient with absolute value. Uh, and in front, uh, so the theta angle cannot appear in the perturbative running. Uh, it does not affect the uh, uh, perturbative. And so this term would be uh, log of absolute value of lambda. This will not be homomorphic. And so this is not allowed. So these are loop, extra loop corrections. On the other hand, you can have uh, instant dot corrections, uh, but they will look like uh, lambda over phi. So B times uh, K, the instant on number, so it is K instant on correction. So now this is uh, holomorphic, and this is uh, 
know, these corrections are nothing. And they think they, they will appear. So, okay, so now if you want to do an exercise to make sure that you understood the, uh, the running gauge coupling in some meters, you could consider some SE2 gauge theory with matter in a say, fundamental, even an isospin. And it's a good exercise to try to determine the matter content such that the one loop that the function is zero. In those cases, the theory is conformal. Okay, this is an exercise I recommend. And uh, all right, so let's uh, stop here. And uh, after the break, we'll uh, begin discussing some of the different solutions. So we're finally uh, in part three, which I think will cover the rest of the course. I've never reached part four. Uh, so, but okay, this is uh, this was the main objective of the course is to explain uh, uh, the solution given by Cyber and Wittens uh, to the infrared dynamics of n equal to super young meals uh, theory with no matter content uh, for simplicity. So, what they did in uh, this paper was to determine uh, uh, the exact uh, infrared uh, effective action. of pure SC2 superior means. So in this case, uh, uh, there are uh, not even hypermultiples. They have a uh, follow-up uh, where they study SC2 theories with uh, uh, hypermultiples uh, quarks, but uh, I will not be able to get there. Um, Okay, so the infrared effective action, as I wrote and with uh, as I wrote earlier, and uh, I will remind you in a second, is determined by this uh, effective prepotential. So what they did was uh, to determine uh, exactly the infrared effective prepotential. Okay. So um, ideally, I mean, since this is some uh, effective action, you would obtain it by integrating out exactly the. Uh, short distance modes in the path integral, but this obviously is very hard, so people don't know how to do it. But, and they found uh, a way around to determine the infrared effective action based on uh, uh, a number of requirements, uh, such as uh, holomorphy of the prepotential, which is uh, required by n equal to supersymmetry, symmetry con considerations, which in, in this case uh, rely on. Uh, the R symmetry, unitarity, electric magnetic duality, and finally weak coupling results, such as uh, the one loop running with the gauge coupling. Well, plus knowing uh, a little bit of mathematics, <laughs> simply explain. So indeed, uh, in this solution, a uh, uh, crucial role will be played by some uh, auxiliary Riemann surface, uh, which in this case looks like uh, a curve, uh, which will somehow uh, contain all the information uh, about the infrared interaction. And uh, okay, I should mention that even though so this solution uh, applies to theories with uh, n equal to supersymmetry. In their paper, they also show that one can uh, then break n equal to supersymmetry to n equal one uh, supersymmetry by introducing a mass term uh, for the scalar and the vector multiple. And they were able to show that uh, um, in such case, uh, um, at low energy, you will uh, find n equal one uh, uh, supersymmetric means with the SE2 gauge uh, group. And the theory was uh, uh, known or expected to confine. And what Cyber Britain did was to show explicitly that this confinement in n equal 1 uh, uh, super young means is due to the condensation of uh, monopoles and diamonds. Uh, and this realizes an old idea due to Tolkien's NFTs uh, for the physical mechanisms of confinement. So I will explain this uh, in the rest of the course. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start.
start. And maybe let me set up the notation uh, again. So we start uh, in the UV with some uh, UV Lagrangian for S2 supercalinus, which takes the standard form which I wrote yesterday. But let me write it again for uh, future references. So here, tau of S2 is the coupling in the UV S2 theory. And then you have a uh, gene of kinetic terms plus uh, kinetic terms for the scalar. Uh, so here, tau of S2 is theta of S2 over to i plus i for pi over g squared from S2. And then because there is a scalar potential, which goes by 1 over g squared, of the C2 trace uh, pi pi dagger squared, due to the d terms. And this is minimized by solutions of the d term equations. So in particular, as in the Georgia Glasher model, we can take phi to be A, now of complex scalar, and sigma 3. So, as follows, up to gauge transformations. So here A is a complex scalar, again. <laughs> but recall that there is some uh, Z2 by symmetry, which exchanges A into minus A. This is part of the gauge group, so A and minus A are equivalent. So in particular, the gauge invariant uh, coordinate under the Coulomb branch is the Casimir. Uh, invariant u, which is one half uh, terms i squared, which classically is equal to a squared. Okay, so then uh, I remind you that. Uh, uh, what we did in uh, for the George I Flash model. So if you plug uh, this lab uh, uh, for phi in the SC2 ultraviolet Lagrangian, um, and you only focus on, I mean, some of the fields uh, will get a mass due to the Higgs mechanism, and if we only focus on uh, the massless fields, uh, uh, okay, so I. Uh, this place S2 is 1 uh, times the bar group. Okay, so if you just look at the, the massless fields, uh, in particular if you look at the uh, gauge field, uh, so this is uh, obtained by looking at the gauge field. Uh, components which are say, parallel or commuting with the background. Okay, so this is what I had done uh, yesterday in the third type flash models, something like this. And similarly for the super partners. So I recall which of this uh, uh, normalization because that and the E1 charges uh, uh, are integers. So you plug it, uh, and then as uh, we call it, you plug it back into the uh, ultraviolet Lagrangian. Uh, and this will reduce, again, uh, this is only classical, into some uh, U1 uh, super Maxwell. Lagrangian for the line energy fields. 
And if you match uh, uh, parameters, you will find that uh, the coupling, uh, the complex supply coupling of the flow energy, so this is the infrared coupling of the low energy um, Lagrangian in terms of U1 gauge fields is related by a factor of two to the coupling in the uh, of SQ2. So, okay, so maybe let me stress. So, this is the ultraviolet Lagrangian, and this is uh, the infrared Lagrangian just for the massless fields. <coughs> Again, this correspondence is only classical. So, in the following, we should keep in mind the distinction. Uh, so, we start from some uh, uh, SU2 gauge theory defined at uh, high energy, and we're interested in the physics that uh, low energy, where the gauge group is uh, broken from SU2 to U1, and so we want to determine the uh, exact form of the effective action for this U1 theory in the infrared. So in particular, we'll, uh, we would like to determine how the effective coupling of this uh, U1 theory depends on, uh, say, the parameters in the UV Lagrangian and the vacuum expectation value of phi. OK, so this was classical. So now what happens, uh, what changes at the quantum level? So I already told you that there is a, uh, a U1 uh, R anomaly, and also uh, related to this, the gauge coupling runs. So in the quantum theory, so, OK, so first of all, uh, so we'll have a vacuum expectation value for the scalar phi, so some quantum vacuum expectation value. And OK, let's declare this to be 8 times sigma 3. And the scalar phi, remember, has a U1 R charge 2. And then uh, we also introduce uh, the well defined uh, you know, physical gauge invariant combination, which is this scalar U. So classical U, U was about half trace phi squared. And we will define U quantum mechanically to be the expectation value. Of one half uh, trace phi squared. Okay, so this are, is our definition of u. So for large values of a, this will uh, uh, start like uh, its classical uh, answer, which is a squared. But uh, there will be quantum corrections that uh, again we would like to determine. So this U, which is, uh, will serve as a, a good coordinate on uh, the Coulomb branch, which is the, the modular space of aqua, sorry, as uh, R charge 4, which does, does it close like phi squared. So next we have, a, a, a remind you, we have the, the U1R symmetry, say with uh, transform two parameters e to the i alpha. This is broken uh, by the anomaly to a Z8 subgroup. So the transformations here will reflect it to the I2 pi and uh, over 8, where n uh, runs from 0 to 7. But, uh, in addition, the the scalar phi acquires expectation values, in particular, we have an expectation value for trace phi squared. And this uh, will, uh, in addition, break uh, spontaneously this uh, anomaly free um, Z8 symmetry to a subgroup, uh, which is uh, Z4. So here the transformation will look like e to the i2 pi m over 4, set here, and from 0 to 7. Uh, and, uh, so why is that? So this is uh, okay. Breaking. So here we call U has the R charge four, so U transform into P to the I for I alpha U. So here, if you restrict alpha to take these discrete values, we will go to the E to the I pi N U. 
And uh, if you further restrict to the Z4 subgroup of Z2, this will be by U in diagonal okay? So this Z4 subgroup is not broken and is, uh, uh, survives even in the, in the vacuum of five uh, squared and quite expectation volume. Next, we have a, we have the one loop running of the company. And the formula is uh, given as follows. So lambda is some uh, strongly coupled generated scale. And lambda over mu to the 4 is equal to the to the 2 pi i tau uh, sc2 the scale mu. So in particular, let me uh, denote, uh, let me introduce an uh, ultraviolet scale lambda uv. So if I replace mu with an uh, ultraviolet scale lambda uv, I'll get to the 2 pi i tau uh, sc2 of lambda uv. And we will view this uh, uh, lambda uv as some, uh, say, ultraviolet cutoff where we define uh, the coupling of SC2. So this would be identified uh, with the bare coupling of the theory. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, UV coupling. But we're interested in uh, the low energy coupling. So let's call tau of A the uh, infrared uh, effective coupling. For the low energy U1 theory. Okay. Like here, but now taking into account uh, one loop direction. So as I told you before, this is uh, obtained by considering uh, the renormalization group running of, uh, of the coupling, and then uh, if we give vacuum expectation value to phi, the running gauge coupling will freeze at some scale, so we have this uh, picture like this, perturbative of one log uh, a one of g squared. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. So this tau of A is uh, the complexification of this effective coupling. Now so if you take into account uh, quantum correction, one loop quantum correction, so tau of A which is equal to twice uh, tau of S2. At the scale A, this 2 is again uh, due to normalization. And this is equal to, say, twice tau uv minus a over 2 pi i log a over lambda uv plus some corrections. And using this formula, or equal to minus a over 2 pi i log of a over lambda using this other formula when mu is replaced by a again plus corrections so and uh, okay when absolute value of a is much larger than the absolute value of lambda instanton corrections will be small and this approximation will be a good approximation So this is uh, the answer that we expect in a weak, uh, weakly coupled region where the uh, vacuum expectation value of the scalar field is large.
So now we'll, uh, again, we look at the n equal to infrared uh, effective action. Uh, so this is the uh, low energy effective action for the U1 theory that we get in the infrared, but just for the massless degrees of freedom. Okay. So once again, this effective Lagrangian. Well, okay. So I mean, like notation. So you, so we have a U1 uh, n equal to vector multiplier. I don't mean the the scalar, the complex scalar A, and they give you know the new alpha. So A starts like A plus some um, corrections, and then the alpha starts like lambda alpha plus um, super partners. So the effective Lagrangian again takes the usual uh, form, which is determined by the potential. I'm repeating uh, these formulas many times so that it will stick to your head. And you are. So, and we want to determine the infrared effective action, so we want to determine the prepotential of this first derivative and second derivative. So, yeah. so let's first look at the sector uh, which includes the scalars in the vector multiplet, which is this part. So we have a Keller potential. which is a function of the scalars or say the chirals in the vector multiplet and this will come from the first term and it's equal to 1 over 4 pi imaginary far and prime of a times a bar okay. so in particular the metric on the long branch or say on the modular space of alpha Is nothing but uh, the Keller matrix which follows from this uh, Keller potential. Okay. So we look like um, d s squared equal 1 over 4 pi. So the Keller matrix is uh, obtained, uh, remember, by taking two derivatives, one with respect to a, one with respect to a bar of the Keller potential. And when you do that, you get the second derivative of the Keller potential, d a, d a bar. So, well, all right, maybe it's a, okay. So the comment here is that uh, this, killer, the, this uh, formula for the killer potential, it's not uh, um, covariant, uh, or actually, well, it's not covariant under all changes, all coordinate changes of A, a bar. So here I'm using uh, so-called uh, special coordinates. Uh, So here A is a special coordinate. And uh, what is special about this coordinate is that, uh, so this is uh, A in special coordinates. It's related uh, to um, the gauge, uh, to the gauge in a super fields uh, linearly. Okay? So if you do a, uh, any change, uh, any holomorphic change of coordinates in A, uh, you might write the Keller potential in a different form. But then, let's say, the first term and the second term uh, will not look will not be related uh, as easily. So we'll stick to this uh, uh, choice of uh, coordinates. Uh, because it makes manifest uh, an equal to super symmetry. So 
Next, uh, uh, let's look at the pH kinetic term for the hexagonal article. So we have uh, some uh, effective uh, complexified pH coupling. Now, uh, of uh, A, which is uh, given by this term, and the coefficient of alpha that you alpha, and so this is uh, nothing but the second derivative of the free potential. So we can rewrite the metric uh, on the Coulomb branch. Well, as 1 over 4 pi, imaginary part uh, of the complex side effective uh, up in dA, dA bar. Okay. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, uh, so always the imaginary, imaginary part is taken on both of those terms, right? Yes. So indeed, here in the color potential, I had the uh, no, no, above mm -hmm. the axis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Both. Yes. Sorry. Exactly. So, indeed, the uh, indicator of potential I have an imaginary part in the process. Well, yeah, to make sure that this is real. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe a comment. Uh, notice that uh, so since the action only depends on uh, the second derivative of the prepotential, and here it would look like it depends on the first derivative. But in fact, uh, <coughs> only the second derivative of f, uh, which is uh, physical, so you can uh, identify f uh, up to um, I don't know, linear terms. The reason is the following. So if you shift f by a constant, obviously it doesn't change the action. So what happens, happens instead if you shift f by a linear term? Uh, shifting f by a linear term, if you now look at the killer potential, just shift the killer potential by, say, some um, a term uh, which is proportional to a uh, imaginary part of a bar. Okay, so this is a killer transformation. doesn't do anything to the low energy physics. So uh, physically, I mean, F uh, is determined up to this uh, linear ambiguity. Okay, so let me also stress here that uh, in, uh, in the metric, uh, the coefficient of the, uh, of the metric is like this, so dA, dA bar is, is uh, positive, this is the absolute value of dA squared, and so uh, geometrically, uh, this is a the, the metric has to be positive, and this requires a column right here. Imagine a part of tau of a has to be larger than zero. Okay. It could be equal uh, to zero at singularities. So geometrically, again, this is just a requirement that the metric is positive, but because this uh, uh, metric is the killer metric which uh, determines the kinetic terms of the uh, of uh, the scalars, uh, uh, this is nothing but uh, the physical requirement of unitarity. Okay, so we want a uh, positive definite kinetic term. Okay, so we'll go back to this formula in a second. Uh, So let me leave some space here for a further comment. So then uh, um, we can compute the free potential f of a uh, perturbatively using the one loop uh, running of the coupling. Why is that? Because we know that uh, the second derivative of the effective free potential is given by the effective coupling. So if you take, uh, if you integrate twice uh, uh, the form. Uh, the, the formula for the perturbative running of the coupling that I wrote before, uh, you'll find the perturbative form of the prepotential, which is uh, takes this form, i over 4 pi. Well, okay, maybe let me know. So this is uh, the double integral of uh, 
that was A, and so again up to integration constants, which affect this uh, uh, linear and constant terms. Uh, you'll find that this is equal to i over pi a squared by the minimum a squared over lambda squared minus 3. Okay. This is just from the one loop formula for the gauge tapping. Okay, so non perturbatively in the full theory. The, the full uh, exact effective uh, prepotential that you want to determine will start like the, the perturbative term, so i over pi a squared log over a squared over lambda squared minus t, plus uh, uh, non perturbative instantan corrections, which take this form. So, okay, why is that? So, um, so this is a Taylor series in lambda over a to the fourth. So this is allowed by homomorphism in principle. We can uh, uh, we can have any function, holomorphic function of lambda to the fourth divided by a to the fourth here on the right hand side for perturbative uh, terms. And then the fact that you only get uh, say positive powers. Uh, uh, it's, be, it's because when uh, A uh, is absolute value of A is much larger than absolute value of lambda, so we go down to the weak coupling region, so the answer is better uh, agree to uh, very good accuracy with the perturbative answer. Okay, so this is the reason for the positive power. The 4 here is just uh, the one loop uh, as a function coefficient. And then, uh, finally, I told you that the prepotential must carry a charge 4, and uh, this is why I wrote the a squared in front of them to carry the correct charge. So what we would like to do in principle is to determine all these coefficients. And say so if we differentiate twice, we can write a similar formula. For the effective coupling. Where I'm going to figure out the relation between tau k and fk. Okay, so once again we have a perturbative part plus uh, uh, in, uh, in the many subtle corrections. Okay, so I left some uh, space here because uh, I want to introduce some uh, uh, extra ingredients. So here we had uh, introduced now the effective coupling, uh, which was the second derivative of the prepotential, uh, because it appears in this term in the action. But so here instead, uh, in the kinetic term uh, for the scalars, uh, so namely the killer potential, we have the first derivative. Uh, of the three potential, so let's give it a name. So for reasons uh, which will become clear in the following, we will uh, call the first derivative of the three potential as uh, a dual. So then uh, using uh, this definition, this new variable, the killer potential is 1 over 4 pi, imaginary part of a dual. Uh, a bar and the metric uh, on the modular space is 1 over 4 pi imaginary b a dual b a bar. Finally, the coupling, uh, the effective coupling uh, tau a low energy is uh, derivative of the a dual spectrum.
So why did uh, uh, I introduce this uh, notation uh, calling the first derivative the potential a dual? Because now that I've done it, you see that uh, a dual and a essentially appear on the same footing in the scalar potential, and therefore in the uh, metric uh, on the moduli space. And uh, okay, so this will uh, uh, we'll see in a few minutes that this is related to electric magnetic duality. So, so indeed, uh, typically the special coordinates uh, are sometimes people call just A the special coordinates, but otherwise you can call A, B, and A dual and A the special coordinates. So geometrically, The Coulomb branch of the moduli space is uh, a, a killer manifold, just can use uh, any for one supersymmetry, so it's metric defined, uh, it's derived from a killer potential. But uh, yeah, here we have some extra structure where the killer potential takes this uh, very simple form in terms of uh, uh, A and the dual coordinate, uh, which uh, comes from the first derivative of the free potential, and some manifolds which satisfy the killer manifolds which have this structure are called uh, region uh, special scalar manifolds. So this is the geometry of the Coulomb branch. It's a region special scalar manifold meaning that you can introduce a coordinate and the dual coordinate, which is derived from the free potential, such that uh, the metric takes this form. Okay, so, all right, so let me skip maybe a few, a few comments, which are probably not that uh, Important, but so let me just uh, make a comment here. So let's look at this uh, Keller potential or the Keller metric, and uh, so you can see that uh, the Keller metric is uh, invariant under this change of variables. Take uh, the dual special coordinate and special coordinate of A and map them uh, and do a linear transformation, possibly with a constant uh, term, yeah. constant vector. So here, if uh, the matrix M uh, is an uh, SL2, sorry, SL2. Our matrix uh, at this point, uh, then uh, the metric uh, in uh, in the new uh, coordinates will look exactly like the metric in the old coordinates. So the metric is invariant under these uh, transformations. So what we will see in a second. So this is uh, reminiscent of uh, electric magnetic duality where we had uh, SL2Z. And uh, okay, we'll see. I guess maybe I should start uh, a little bit and then continue in the afternoon. We'll see that indeed that this uh, change of coordinates are nothing but electromagnetic duality transformations. And when we impose that the charges are quantized, uh, this means <coughs> them we have to be in S to Z as we saw in the non person. Okay, so let me take it. Since I started late, let me take uh, five or ten more minutes to begin with electric magnetic duality.
So remember that we, we studied electric magnetic duality for a non suppressing metric uh, abelian theory. Now we're going to do the same for a uh, abelian gauge theory with any part two suppressed symmetry. Okay? So, but let's start from here. So we have this uh, classical invariant uh, of, uh, of the Keller metric uh, under uh, SL2R transformations plus shift by constant. So first of all, say SL2R is generated by matrix, uh, matrix PB, where it looks like this, where now B is a real uh, parameter, and by the S transformation that we saw the other day. So if we consider how TB, this transformation TB, which depends on the real parameter, Acts on tau, and we use say this definition of tau uh, and the transformation law above. Uh, well, okay, maybe not. I'll get here in a second. So let me state here that so if we plug this transformation law into the definition of tau, we say that tau of a goes into a tau plus b divided by c tau. Plus D, where M is uh, it's on A, B, C, D with the terminal form. Okay? So now if I specialize this transformation of a uh, tau to this particular matrix uh, generator of a set to R with parameter B, I get that tau goes into tau plus B. Where now B is, uh, is just a real parameter. But we know that uh, physics is invariant. Uh, Uh, only if tau is sent to tau say, plus one for an integer. And so this tells us that B, so this physical requirement, and this corresponds to shifting the dynamic of to pi, this imposes that B has to be an integer. Okay? So eventually, uh, the SL2R group of uh, transformations which leave the metric invariant uh, have to be restricted to SL2Z. So transformations where uh, all the entries in the matrix are integers. Okay, again, this is uh, uh, the requirements which follows from uh, the fact that physics is invariant by shift of the theta angles by to pi. And this is nothing by, but the SL2Z uh, duality group that we saw in the non symmetric case. So what uh, I will start to do uh, this afternoon is to look at the derivation of the electric magnetic duality that I sketched for uh, a billion non symmetric theories extends to supersymmetric theories. Uh, OK. So let's stop here. Let's move this afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.